the traitor Baru Kamarant by Seth Dickinson, ask us as readers to do something that you do not see very often from a fantasy author, and that is to put away the sword and the shield. It is to put away the staff and the wand. Trade all that in for intellect, for knowledge, and for an accountant's ledger. That is right. We will be following a neurodivergent accountant in this book. And if you had told me that this would end up being one of my favorite books of the year and one that really sticks out in my memory as something special and unique in the fantasy genre, I probably would have had my doubts, but I'm here to tell you today uh, that I think that this book is absolutely remarkable. I'm Jimmy Nuts from the Fantasy Network, and I'm always doing some sort of book review here on the channel or some sort of bookish content. If this is your first time checking out the channel, I would invite you to like and subscribe and all that good YouTube stuff. I'd love to have you along, but we have to talk about this book because I do think it is a standout. This is a book that is tackling colonialism and what it happens whenever a people are encroached on by an empire, not in a means of military and force, but by other means that are far more mundane uh, and somehow just as terrifying uh, in some ways. Baru Kumaran is a very young protagonist. She is a girl living on an island that is just actually discovering reading for the first time. When we first meet her at the beginning, her introduction is fantastic. She is seven years old. Uh, by the end of chapter two, she's actually 18. So this is a very quick glimpse into what it is to be a child uh, here on this island. And there's something about being introduced to a very young protagonist in this situation. You know, we've seen a lot of inspection of imperialism and colonialism in fantasy. And most of the time it's coming from the ruling class of that place, or maybe uh, someone who is a little bit older, but very rarely do you see someone open up a story with a seven-year-old and how that would impact them in a very formative time of their life. Like I mentioned, uh, Baru is just learning how to read at this moment, and she's learning the magic of reading and how it enables the curiosity uh, that just ends up consuming ch uh, children of that age. I know it did for me, and that makes her so, so relatable. She's searching for definitions of words she doesn't know, like their answers to the questions of the universe. And maybe you watching this feel the way I do, but I remember that amazing feeling. And still today, when I find a new word, and I'm like, wow, I, that is, that's exactly what I wanted to say. This is the perfect word for that. Uh, there's something magical about that. And we open up the story with that uh, through otherwise a very dark and bleak point of view. This is sold through third person through uh, just the POV of Baru. And this book is as dark as it gets. I know that you probably aren't expecting that, especially I'm talking about the magic of reading and opening up the of the novel, but it is. It is extremely grim. Uh, every trigger warning you could ever imagine exists in this book, which is another thing that really took me by surprise, just how heavy I found this read to be. Baru's island is called Terranok, which is basically an opposition of the Falcrest Empire. There are other places in this world as well, uh, but Terranok is its own place. It has its own culture and its own customs. Uh, for instance, the families have two fathers, and they do have a mother who is actually going out and doing a lot of the hunting and the killing and more of an active role, and they trade in non-paper money. In opposition, we have the Falcrest Empire, who is coming in and has taken over all the parts of the world and they have a treaty with these people. And while they claim not to conquer places, but to work with places, I think we've seen this before, they only buy goods with their paper money, therefore restricting who Terranoke or whatever any other island can trade with. So you see how this is a very devious and sly way of limiting outside contact for this island. And then everyone now is dealing within this currency system that Falcrest has brought with their merchants. I love this. I think this is such a different take on colonialism, and it's one that I haven't really seen before getting in to the more, you know, the minutia of colonialism. Uh, and not so much as we arrive, you know, more of an imperialistic take. This, this really goes into how this happens. I don't get it. Why don't they just fight back? Well, that's a great question, Bobby B. Why wouldn't they fight back? And one of the reasons is because Falcrest is benefiting the people in some ways by bringing merchants and bringing goods and advanced technology and uh, basically, you know, smartening up these barbarians and taking that attitude. And one of the main things that, that begin to happen is that they start opening up schools and they infiltrate the education system. And these schools, funded by a lot more money, have a lot more stuff to offer. Uh, but in that education system, they're reprogramming these children to see their culture and their families almost as animalistic. There's a quote from the book that really hurt me 
uh, deep down. Like I mentioned before, the families have two fathers and then a mother. Uh, and one of the quotes or a thought that Baru has, and it's just, it's, it's treacherous after going to the school that Falcrest has instilled was, was Psalm my real father or was he only a sodomite? The takeover begins right there. Whenever you can start getting people to doubt their culture uh, and their family and the people that they love, I mean, you have done a, a, a devious thing, uh, but however, a very powerful thing. And you're getting these kids and also these people to be subservient to you because you aid them with advanced technology and wisdom. And they're only, we're only trying to help you and bring you into the next century. Uh, ugh, you know, it is, it's rough. And again, we're in a child's perspective where they're being formed, right? Baru is uh, in a very important time in her life. And because of her family feeling defensive about what they know is going on, they are, that's the thing, they are helpless. You know, they would love to fight back, but ultimately uh, they can't. Uh, they're, they're outmanned, outgunned, and people do seem to like some of the things that they bring to this place. And whenever a family becomes, you know, or a people become defensive against an empire, it's hard to look at them as not just being um, hyperbolic or negative. Oh, you're overreacting. And Baru has a thought where she says she liked her teacher's advice better than her mother's because it was full of things to accomplish rather than things to avoid forever. Falcrest the Empire is telling these people, you do not have to be afraid. You can embrace these things. Look, look how they want to restrict everything that you want. Uh, you want to learn and telling you to be afraid of all these things. Well, we're just trying to give you the knowledge to be a powerful person. The Empire, which is called the Masquerade, preaches over and over and over to these people that your wits matter. When you wear a mask, your wits matter. However, the only intelligence that they seem to value is that of which they have brought with them on their ships, along with their soaps and currency and everything else. Uh, there's almost this idea that... <laughs> that there are no strong women, right, in, in Terranoak. There's also no smart people. There's no way. You guys are, you guys are so uh, barbarian. There's no way that you could ever be smart, and you're missing out if you're not listening to us and taking our advice and taking our aid. Uh, the gaslighting that the teacher does to borrow is honestly one of the most infuriating things I've read <laughs> in recent memory. Uh, maybe the most angry I've been since Kindred wasn't all that long ago. But essentially convincing Baru that, yes, one day you can become a strong woman, as if Baru is not strong already at this young age. She is. She's, she's living and experiencing some of the hardest things that her people have ever had to experience. Or the fact that, you know, her mother isn't already a strong woman who's going out and getting the kills and hunting and, and putting food on the table and helping this family survive through this extremely tough time. There's already strong females here. <laughs> we don't need you, Falcrest. I, I know I'm kind of going into the weeds a little bit, but I want you to understand just like how emotional this book felt for me in a lot of ways and just how I think it deals with things on, on a different level than a lot of other fantasy that tries to tackle this theme at a very surface, you know, uh, puddle level. This is more of an ocean. This is real political intrigue as well. There's political maneuvering that takes place over long periods of time. And I think that this is the litmus test for if you actually like political fantasy. I hear a lot of people say, oh, this book had a lot of political intrigue. And then I will read it. And a lot of times I feel a little bit um, disappointed because it's it's just someone making uh, a rash decision or someone scheming to take a throne. Like that seems to always be the extent of political intrigue in a lot of books that I read nowadays. But this one actually takes its time and explores the idea of power dynamics between different ranks and also who's actually in charge of this thing and who do you need to gain influence through and how, and this is Baru's story, how far down the rabbit hole of evil do you go and kind of become subservient to this empire so that you can seek your revenge? How far is too far? Do you lose yourself in that process? These are the questions uh, that this book poses, and I think it does an excellent job of doing that. This is low fantasy with Machiavellian overtones, and if that sounds good to you, you should pick this up like tomorrow. Baru has this mindset that she is going to change the system from within. She is going to make a statement, and she's going to get her revenge, but even before she can graduate from this Falcrest, Falcrest Academy, which, by the way, this isn't really any kind of spoilers. This is all very, very early in the book. Uh, before she can graduate from their little school, she's already facing uh, trials and tribulations just over her beliefs and the fact that these people are very bigoted to a lot of the things that Baru holds near and dear. 
uh, she has to start bending. And you can already see Baru having this inner conflict who is also, you know, socially awkward. She, she's brilliant. They even call her a savant at some points. Uh, and even though she's brilliant, she struggles in the social capacity. So she's always calculating her moves and trying to understand if she did the right thing. And I think for a lot of people that could be extremely relatable. But even in the early stage of this book, you can see her making compromising from, from who she is. And that is how deep the hooks are uh, from this empire. Even when the empire in this book are trying to do the right thing, uh, for instance, there's a plague that breaks out on Terranoke, which by the way, they brought the plague with them. So that's great. Uh, they are keeping the children within the walls who they've taken from their families, essentially. And they're trying to protect them from the plague. But if you think about it, the plague is actually killing the older generation off and leaving only the ones who have been reprogrammed by their own education system. It's it, diabolical stuff. Um, but while they are locked in that school, the abuse that goes on is harrowing. And shows you that they really have no interest in protecting these people at all. Uh, like I said, this book is very dark. So as the back of the book states, and it's very early in the book, uh, Boru is essentially kind of collected by the Empire as someone who is a just absolute brilliant accountant. She is super duper intelligent. She shipped off to squash a rebellion through ledgers and finances uh, for the masquerade in a totally different area of the world. And she's very uh, bright, but she's also not perfect. She struggles, and not least of all, with trying to accomplish her larger goals while also facing her immediate goals and her immediate problems while she's wearing this imperial mask, essentially. And also not just her role within this empire and for her people and not forgetting them, uh, but also just for her safety as an individual. And I am myself not... Um, neurodivergent or autistic, but I would love to know if someone who, who is has read this book and what you thought of the portrayal of this uh, protagonist. I don't know if Seth Dickinson has any experience with this, but it felt like from the people I know that are very close to me that I love um, that are neurodivergent who have told me their experiences being uh, being in challenging situations socially, I felt like this was such a good lens. Uh, to explore this through. And I felt like it was a true depiction, but again, I would feel more comfortable if someone who actually has uh, more personal experience with that would be able to comment on that. So if you do, please let me know down in the comments below if you've read this book. Baru doesn't just struggle socially, but she also struggles with her self-confidence, which is something I think most readers, uh, unless if you're perfect, can actually uh, relate to. And I'm very curious if this is the type of book that uh, is trying to expose the bias that people feel like people who are very emotional and have troubles with their emotions are automatically unintelligent. I think that it goes against the grain is saying, no, they're socially and emotionally very, um, we'll, we'll use the word unkept, though I don't know if that's uh, the best word for this, uh, but they are brilliant and super hyper intelligent. Um, it's just the fact that, you know, sometimes emotions can be a little bit harder to grasp than ideas or concepts for people. And there is in my, at least in my opinion, a bias in our culture here in America, where if someone is very emotional, we look at them as almost silly and we don't take them serious and they are not intelligent. And I just don't think that that is true. And I think that this is a really good example of the opposite here. And sometimes Baru's calculation is so cold that it is absolutely terrifying. And other times I find it to be extremely sympathetic, for instance, and this is not a spoiler, but uh, she's in a situation where there are bodies laying around and she is essentially going through a traumatic event before our very eyes. And the only thing she can do because she's so distressed is she hyper fixate on counting the dead bodies around her. And that is how she gets through that moment. Someone could look at that and be like, wow, how could she think to count the bodies at this moment for like some report? But in reality, she's doing that because it's the only way she can handle her situation. I mean, it is little details like this. This could be glanced over by, by a lot of readers, but this is the stuff that makes me feel like Seth Dickinson is someone we need to pay attention to going forward. And uh, I'm definitely going to be reading the sequels of this, by the way. This is supposed to be a four book series. There are three books published. I've heard the other two are fantastic as well. We're just waiting on that fourth book. Um, but this is someone I'm going to be reading more from because it seems like he really cares about the content and the characterization that he puts into his novels. And the story unfolds from there in Trader Baru Kamaran. I hope I've given you a good idea, but I, want, well, I just want to say that I think the other big question that this book poses in the main conflict of the story is not... Uh, whether the system is good or bad, that is that is not really up for debate, but rather 
how does one go about changing those circumstances and rebelling? And there's one side that says, you know, compliance until a certain point where we can flip it and change from within. And then the other opposition to that is breaking the system utterly and completely, breaking the wheel. And there are two ideas that I think are presented very well and nuanced through multiple cultures and through a whole bunch of different people who have different beliefs about how things should be, different sexual orientations, uh, and also just different races. I, I, I love this book. I think, I think it's brilliant. And there are parts of it that may seem a little dry to some folks. There are times where there's a little bit of accountant details that go in here. But to see the way uh, an empire can inflict damage and take over through everyday tasks as simple as balancing a ledger is wild because it's true. But also seeing someone maneuver who isn't overly strong or you know, all powerful or super confident even, and having a protagonist that is just using their uh, given abilities to be brilliant in a certain field and then see how they can change the world to that. It, it, as a reader, it feels a little bit empowering thinking that I don't need to be the biggest, the fastest, or the strongest, or even the most intelligent in all areas, but that maybe we can change oppressive systems or the world through the talents that we have and to just have to step out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I think that's what Baru does. And I think that she is courageous and brave, even though she is very nuanced and is not presented as a, you know, a purely good character. She makes some decisions that I have to just question, but I do find her to be brave because she's someone who doesn't feel socially comfortable. She's someone that doesn't have a ton of self-confidence and she's someone who in a lot of situations seems powerless but really behind the scenes is is moving money and changing fates of provinces and, and duchies and everything else. It is something to behold. Uh, a fantasy protagonist for a new age, but also a fantasy protagonist that stands out among the thousands upon thousands that we've had in the genre. And I don't make these statements lightly. You may find some of it dry. And I think that there are a ton of names that you're going to have to remember that are very difficult to remember. It kind of reminds me of Prince of Nothing in that regard, where I just struggled with names the entire way through that trilogy. But... It is one that if you give it time and attention, I think you'll find something different here than you've seen in other fantasy books, obviously, but even ones that tackle colonialism, I don't think they knew nearly as good of a job as this book here. Two things I wanted to comment on. Uh, is there any combat in this book? Yes, uh, but don't expect Baru to be this big badass that just goes around stomping people out. That's not how it works, but there are people that she can hire and use and everything else. And the few combat scenes that are in this book, and there are very few, I thought were so excellently done and not because they were realistic or whatever, but the tension, especially through the POV of Baru is incredible. In my opinion, um, there is a duel that is just outstanding and I loved it. And I would love to hear what you think about it. The other note I want to make before I let you go here today is that I did listen to some of this on audible and your mileage may vary, but I did not like the audio book narrator at all. I thought she was way too flat in some circumstances and just didn't, I don't know. I didn't think the performance was very good. So I enjoyed reading this with my eyes. Also with some of the names, I think it's better to see it than hear it uh, because it's just like, who? <laughs> who are they talking about? Um, but those are just two quick notes that I wanted to make here. So as an overall rating, what would I say about <laughs> Trader Boru Kamarat? Well, it's one of the best books I've read of 2000. 23 um, and will stand out my memory uh, for a good time, I would imagine. And I am going to say I am overwhelmingly positive on this book without a doubt. Uh, I try to go on, you know, kind of like neutral, mostly positive, positive, very positive, overwhelmingly positive. So this is getting the highest mark from me. Um, other than the fact that, you know, there is a couple spots that might feel a little bit dry. It's a very quick read. It is under 400 pages. Uh, and then I just different. It's different and it resonated with me and made me have all the feels. And as someone who does appreciate uh, going into the more heavier things of the human experience, I think that this book does a great job of it while using really plain language that actually drives it home even more. Just that matter of fact statement of these terrible things that are going on in the world. Um, big recommend for me. Hey, if you like this video, you can hit like on it. If you dislike it, you can hit dislike. If you loved it, think about subscribing. If you've read this before, put a comment down below. Let me know what you think. And if you're going to read it, let me know what got you interested in this book. Was it this review? Was it a certain part of this review? Was it something you saw somewhere else? I would love 
to know. I hope that you're doing well and I hope that you're safe. There is a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciate it. Until I see you next time, remember to always keep turning the page. I want to give a big shout out to all my patrons, my Wildlings Night's Watch, and my Kingsguard, my high tier patrons, which include Bridger, Josh By Day, Amel, Curtis L, Jonathan J, Prithvi, Eric B, Chadia, Steve Talks Books, Taylor D, Matthias, Stephen R, Carlos, Yolanda, Amanda L, John C, John, Garrick, Evie, Henrik, Benjamin C, Sebastian M, Frank C, C. Scott, Bass, Jacob Wade, Darren, Jobot, Terrence F, Michael B, Lauren M, Nicholas E, Kai C, Kev, Ryan, Reading Rainbow, J, Jennifer M, Shad, Amanda V, Ikaika, RJ, Pat S, Stuart C, Oscar A, Derry, and Tanner. Thank you all so much. You're the best.